Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Orchid Chat with me, William Green, and Stephen Van Camp and Lewis. Stephen, how's apartment life? It's, uh, it's, it's small. It's, uh, it's, it's different. It's, uh, uh, you know, it is what it is. And got all, all my, my plants on the back porch. Apartment life, man. Welcome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, family, orchids, pets, all crammed into a little space. What could go wrong? Everyone's going to get along great, I'm sure. <laughs> totally. What's uh, up with you? What's new? Uh, well, I have installed a self-watering system for my grow tent. And the reason is not so that I don't have to water. The reason is so I can leave for extended periods of time, as I do from time to time, whether it's to visit family or take a trip somewhere, whatever, and relieve my wonderful, wonderful plant sitter from having to come, you know, every other day or whatever. So it's not a substitute for me watering. It's just a kind of a, a nice little buffer there for periods of time that I'm going to be gone. For example, starting next week, I'm going to be out for three weeks and, you know, it's, it's a lot to ask somebody to come and, and watch your collection, you know, during that long of a time. So, and I also, you know, I've got a friend, I've got to, got to give a shout out to Joe. My friend Joe has just been instrumental in helping me figure this out. He has an eight by eight by eight foot grow cube in one of the rooms of his house. Basically it's the whole room and um, it's completely automated. (laughs) And most of his plants are mounted. So it works pretty well because everything dries out pretty much exactly at the same time. So you can just, spray whatever and so um mine's not exactly that easy i've got things potted in different ways i've got some things mounted some things in rocks some things in park but i'm experimenting i've I've got about five days left to figure it out so that it gets wet enough that everything gets a you know an acceptable amount of water but then it also dries out pretty much completely in 24 hours and it, and the cycle can repeat. And so, so I watched your video this past weekend where you, you, you sort of presented it to the world that, that you have this mist King. Yeah. And it looks like you got the, the deluxe set up. I, I used to have one as well for, oh, for cool. terrarium. And I remember going through that process of buying and getting the little automated thing and getting it all set up and then, you know, having the bucket and, um, and it looks like you got, you got, was it four nozzles each with two sprayers? That's right. And, and is that the version that it can actually rain or is it just mist? It's just mist. It's just In mist. In fact, if there was a rain version, I didn't see it. Okay. Maybe, maybe they don't do that anymore. Um, I, would, I, I would hesitate to get a rain version anyway because of the accumulation of water on the bottom of the tent. Because it, with the mist, everything gets coated. You know, and the longer you have it running, things start to drip and that kind of stuff. But the way I've got it right now, so what I've settled on right now is it it clicks on right after sunrise, like 5.45 in the morning. And it sprays for five minutes and everything gets pretty good and soaked, at least on the surface. And then it kicks off and then it's got, you know, 24 hours to dry. And so I'm... I'm watching right now to see how much water from day to day stays in the bottom of the tent. Um, and there are some puddles that don't, they don't evaporate overnight. So those puddles, you kind of have to think, okay, three weeks of this, what will this look like? You know, <laughs> is it um, going to be dripping on, on, on the folks downstairs? <laughs> yeah. Ugh, I hope not. <laughs> um, so I did. Yeah. So- do the- I did redo the bottom of the tent, the lining and everything to, you know, hopefully three layers of vinyl or plastic down there to try to keep any, anything from leaking out. So that's interesting that, so it's sort of a a backup system, but are are you going to keep it? I mean, obviously you're testing it now, or are you going to keep it kind of in? So let's say, you know, you know, you know, uh, when you get back from, from wherever you're going, you know, you're, you're not going to go on vacation for a little while. Are you going to keep it kind of uh, in the, 
in, in the queue, I guess, is it going to continue watering or, or will you go back to hand water? I'm going to, I think I'm, I'd like to keep it going the way that it is because some plants, it seems to be really all, all they need. Um, other plants need more water. So right now, just leaving it alone, everything for the most part is a little bit dry and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with a little too dry, especially yeah. the cattleyas. I tend to overwater them anyway. So mm -hmm. making them have, make them a little thirsty. That is fine. Other plants that like the catacetums, for example, the mist doesn't really penetrate the medium. So those, I think it's going to be a combination of the automated system plus some extra hand watering here and there. But it'll be interesting to see if the consistency of the automated system will prevent me from overwatering the water sensitive plants like my Calyrexis, for example. So, so we'll and then, then you'll have you'll have Joe come in and maybe hit the, the ones where the sphagnum isn't getting soaked through or. Oh, now. Yeah, my plant sitter is not Joe, but yeah, somebody's oh. yeah. The plant sitter will will hopefully they're going to just make sure that nothing is going terribly wrong. Um, I think gotcha. the plants can handle three weeks of daily misting. They'll be, I think they'll be fine, you know. And if plant sitter yeah. wants, if plant sitter wants to spot water some stuff that they think looks dry, that's fine. But this, they don't have to, you know. It's basically just keep the reservoir full, and 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 that's that'll be good. And the reservoir, I think, lasts. It's, it'll probably last four to five days, maybe longer. Um, so if, you know, if somebody only has to come check on it once a week, that's, that's, that's great. Is it tap water or you, you got um, five gallon drums of pure water or what? I'm just using tap. Okay. Yeah. And any fertilizer? I did mix uh, Kalite in there at the quarter teaspoon per gallon concentration and i've heard that sometimes fertilizer the nitrogen escapes if you mix it up in water um i don't know if that's true or not but um i, I haven't heard of that but i do remember having to clean the nozzles every now and then to get mm -hmm. the the sort of salts that build up off mm -hmm. and, you know you look in one day and it's just like this little stream coming out of two sides and you're like what's going on and it's just all this crusty stuff yeah yeah i've been told that if i maybe soak them in vinegar or something. I can clean them off or yeah. Did, did you yeah. clean them off on the surface? Was it a surface thing you could do or did you actually have to force something through it or? No, I, I think I soaked them in vinegar. Um, okay. To, to get that off. Yeah. You know, okay. just overnight or something. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we'll see how long it takes for that to happen. Yeah, no, it's exciting to do like sort of a, a big, like collection change. I mean, you, you've sent those plants to the greenhouse. So those little seedlings are being taken care of, which is nice. And then you got this going on. So it just seems like you're uh, hopefully freeing your, yourself up, freeing up some time and making life easier. Yeah. And hopefully introducing consistency. Cause I think these plants really need that. Um, and I'm just not, I'm not consistent. I'm not as consistent as a timer. You know what I mean? I, I sure. And, and I do have a, a habit of, just grabbing the sprayer whenever I open the tent and just, I'm just looking for something I can water. Oh yeah. You need some, <laughs> oh, oh, you know, I'm just hungry to do it. You know, so uh, you look slightly dry. I'm going to spray. Yeah, you. <laughs> exactly. Well, I know I watered you this morning, but I don't see any drops on you anymore. So you need some more, you know, that kind of stuff. So meanwhile, the bottom of the pot's like rotting and I'm not paying attention to that. So that's funny. So we'll see. Cool. Well, you, uh, yeah, it looks like you have some some props there, some show and tell, perhaps. Yes, indeed. So I wanted to show you something that's going well and something that's not going well for me. So you can kind of uh, help me out. So what's going well, I got this little Vanda Falcata from uh, Windy Hill Orchids back in 2015 as a little seedling. And this past Saturday, it got an award of merit, 82 oh. points. And I could not be happier. I absolutely love this thing. And a lot awesome. of my, um, yeah, right. A lot of my, a lot of my viewers have divisions of this thing because I've divided it. I know I've sold off at least eight divisions of this thing. So I, actually yesterday I emailed, I've, you know, dug up old emails from when I was mailing them out. And I was like, 
if you're interested in changing the tag, you know, this is the new name of this plan and it has, a, it has an award of merit on it. So um, on Orchid Pro, which is the American Orchid Society's kind of database of awards, there's well over a hundred awards for Vanda Falcata. I was going to say, it's not so, easy to get that awarded anymore. I know. I was really, really, really excited. They said it was, they said the size was good. They said the shape was good. They also said one of, one of the big things was that as this plant starts to put on more and more flowers, they tend to just become a big jumbled mess, but these, they're just really nicely spaced. Mm -hmm. Everything's kind of spaced out. So well presented. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I took it in last year and they, they kind of passed on it. They were like, well, it's got potential, but it needs some more flowers on it. So this year we came in with seven flowers per spike and, and it was enough. So it, it looks like that's a, those are pretty large flowers. Is, is that mm -hmm. is that the Amami Island variety then? You know, I wonder. I don't know anything about the the provenance of this. You know, I've got the tag, but it doesn't. Maybe I could call or email Marilyn at Windy Hill and, and ask her if she knows where it came from. But I don't know anything about the breeding. But I did wonder that because they are they are pretty good size. If, and, yeah. and if they have that Amami Island genetics and um, that's, that's even better. Yeah. Yeah. That, that gives the, the larger flowers and man, that's, that's nice. That's yeah. so, you know, you've gone from Catlea Rex where you have the only award right in, in the AOS system two, 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 that's right. That's right. Two. Uh, More on so, that later, actually. Yeah. So incredibly rare awards. And then now you have this plant that's very common and is is highly awarded and therefore most judges are like well we're not gonna look at this because it's all been done before right so that's that i mean that's two like very opposite ends of the spectrum and both really like something to be really proud of so that, that's really cool I'm working on my street cred yeah right <laughs> so what would you call it oh i called it so you might know i used to live in japan and the 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 area of Japan, these are and these of course are a Japanese orchid. So I was like, I've got to give it a Japanese name. So uh, there are three sacred mountains in Japan, and the one that was near where I used to work is called Haksan. So I named it Haksan, which means cool. white mountain. So it's white, you know. Huh. So it got a got a Japanese name, and it reminds me of you know a good time in my life as well. Very cool. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I wish that's the one thing the internet does not afford yet is smell vision I mean, I wish I could. It, uh, it's been described to me as soapy jasmine. God. Uh, the fragrance been... kicks on. It uh, kicks on just as the sun starts to go down. It's like 4:35 uh, as the sun starts to kind of descend. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you start to get a little fragrance, and it lasts well into the early morning. But then it kind of shuts off during the day. That's cool. Soapy jasmine. It's been a while since I, I smelled one of those, but yeah, I remember they were intensely fragrant and in a good way. Yeah, no, it's really nice. It's really nice. Cool. Well, um, are we going to do two goods? Be good, you good? And then yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I'll, I'll I'll do the good. So, so this is uh, a division that I got of a Catlea Blasfeldiana. Oh, nice. And there, let's see. Oh, your, your background was trying to blur it. It, it is. Maybe if you I bring it closer. Buds. There's a, there's some buds in here. And so this division, as you can see, ooh, I guess I haven't blurred my background before. Let's see, there we go. It, the division itself is kind of skinny, but it's, it's finally putting on a new root system. And the buds are coming through and then the new growth is healthy as you can kind of see here. Yeah. Ooh, um, that's so exciting. Blasfeldiana is Rex by Luteola. So it's a primary hybrid of Rex that occurs naturally in the wild. That's right. And so you can see how small it is. If I put it up against me, it doesn't blur out. Um, so it, it's not a large plant. So it really took uh, after that that luteola parent in terms of size and and there are i want i can't remember if there's one award for this or zero. Zero. 
zero. I have to tell you right now, there's no there's no award. So if you if you're able to take it in, you'll get a you'll get something. I think. Let me show you the tag because it's an interesting story that I, I don't know much about beyond the tag. Yeah. Um. So it's Blossfeldian. I got it from from Mick. Um, Mick Over Fournier. There, HBI. Yeah. HBI. That's right. And uh, he got a certificate of bot botanical recognition, as you can see up here. In, in uh, he made the division in 2021. But the you can see that it says stripped. So he named it Mick, but it was the the. I think what happened um, is he probably just didn't pay the the. 40 or 50 bucks to have the award registered, right? So if you get an award, you have to pay, right? And AOS members get a little discount on the amount of money that they pay. But if you don't pay, I get, you know, your, your award is stripped. I heard a little so, different story. About this one or just general? Mm -hmm. About that, about that stripped award. Oh, tell me. I heard that it was, um, I and mean, he actually said this to, to the guy who sold me my, um, uh, Blasfeldi on a seedlings that uh, that the uh, award it was something about his membership that he he didn't he didn't renew his membership or he canceled his membership or something like that and when I heard that I was like that doesn't make sense because you don't have to be an AOS member to get an award yeah so that's interesting I I don't know what the real story is but I don't think they strip awards unless. It's, you know, there's, they would go back and find that it wasn't actually a, a legit, you know. Maybe, maybe it's not a Blasfeldian thing. I, I mean, I, I would be surprised. Out. The pictures on his website cer certainly look like it. Yeah. So, yeah. So maybe, maybe it's some sort of non-payment. Um, but in any case, you know, it got that CBR. And if I show it or I get it judged you know, and I get an award since that name Mick was stripped, I could technically rename it whatever I want. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know if I would. Uh, and I don't even know if, if the, the different team that would end up looking at this would say, yeah, this is worth the CBR. I'm just not, thinking so. they use Orchid Pro or Orchid Wiz to look up plants and previous awards. Nothing's going to come up, right? Mm -mm. I mean, so, the, the tag says, you know, I, I showed you the tag. So, so they'll, they'll kind of get that same background. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a big question mark of, of what, what would happen with it. And I don't know. I, you know, maybe, maybe I'll get one flower. And I'm really curious to see if it's fragrant. You know, if, if the luteola kind of removed the fragrance or if it gets that, that Rex, um, scent that you you have described before and uh i'll let I'm you gonna, know i'm gonna guess that it'll, it'll have a light fragrance at least i hope so yeah 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 um That's and the fact that it's yeah yeah i've got it i've got it in the hottest part of my patio um and so you know trial by fire it, it seems to be doing well in the texas heat so it, i think it took after the, the luteola a little more <laughs> cool yeah, yeah, looking forward to seeing that in bloom. Yeah. So what you got? What's your uh, your less than good? Yeah, my challenges for this episode are I've got three uh, three rexes. Two of them are basically kind of runts of the litter. So these are from the original 2014 flask. Um, they've in the past year, they've had issues where kind of the, the back rhizome just kind of turned yellow and then I cut it off and then the, the yellow keeps creeping up. And so, you know, I've had these guys for a long time, but I don't think as, you know, some of them like this one, for example, there's like, there's brown starting to creep up this bulb and that I've already cut off half the plant you know so i'm just thinking these aren't long for this world and maybe they could be saved but i also acknowledge that sometimes it's just not worth saving the ones that really weren't that good at growing in the first place considering there's you know their siblings have been blooming for three or four years now and these you know still look small and weak and 
they don't seem like they're going to make it. So that's just kind of sad. Some people would throw it in the trash immediately. I have a little harder time doing that, but it, I don't think that they're going to be around much longer. And yeah, then, you could toss them or, or give them to someone who, who thinks that they might have a shot at I've thought about work. That. I've thought yeah. about that. I had one that had a little rot on it, um, and I ended up sending it to um, Hillbilly Orchids. You know Paula. You know Paula. Yeah. She has, and she was able to save it. She was able to get rid of the part uh, that was rotting, and so now she had she had those back bulbs start growing for her. And then at last, I heard it was doing really well for her. So I'm I'm glad about that. Um, cool. So yeah, maybe maybe somebody would like to try to save this but i i also hate to just send somebody an actively rotting plant you know what i mean i mean i guess as long as you tell them like hey this plant is not long for this world as you say you're not can't... gonna live yeah but yeah i'm gonna try yeah yeah and then the other one this is a division of that uh one you were mentioning earlier the first awarded one mm -hmm. And again, this, I took this division because it had a growth rot earlier in the spring. Like just as it was starting to bloom, one of the growths just went plop and it was just brown and mush. So I cut that, I cut this half of the plant off and then the back half of the plant, the, it started having rot creep up, up the back of it last week. So I cut off everything, but like the first three bulbs of that one. So I've got, you know, what's potentially a very, important plant to my collection because it's you know it's it's a blooming size rex and it's got an award but i but again i'm like is this is this gonna make it you know what i mean like i'm i'm glad that i have been breeding these like crazy because at least its genetics are locked into a a flask in a lab somewhere so something will go on but um yeah. but i might not i might not have these for much longer i don't know and another thing is I've seen a lot of successful growers growing their plants and their calias and sphagnum. So I've, I've decided to try it out. And what it looks like to me is the roots get down to the surface of the sphagnum and then they just stop. So I'm thinking, all right, how is, how are people getting their calias to grow in sphagnum? If mine don't seem to even want to get, get into it. I, I, I don't know. I've always wondered that as well. I, I know um, a couple of, very, very prolific cat leg growers, um, Claudia Walworth in Florida. She does it that way. Um, and then Mauro Rossum in Brazil, he, he grows his cat leas in, in clay pots. Both of them are in clay pots. And mm -hmm. maybe that's the difference. Maybe it helps dry out a little faster. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and they're amazing cat lea growers. And what I don't understand is, you know, sphagnum breaks down in two years. And if you repot your, your catleas every two years, their roots are, are toast. So I, I don't know if they just pick them out, like to pick the bad pieces out and then re, you know, and then, then all of the Wakariana and Nobili or growers in Japan grow in little clay pots with sphagnum. And that's funny. You know, you don't want to mess with those roots. And, and yet uh, they, they have amazing flowers. Yeah. So. I'm wondering if I'm, if I'm keeping it too wet. I mean, that's often my problem. So I'm thinking, do you like, do you keep it bone dry and then just, you know, soak it and then wait till it's just bone dry again? Like I, I or you just make yeah. a sphagnum layer this thick. Yeah. I've seen, yeah. I've seen it very thin. Yeah. And then it dries out. Yeah. So but all, all the pots that I've seen from Claudia, Mauro and the Japanese growers, I mean, it's a full pot. Mm -hmm. and there's like there's there's sphagnum and so I, I don't know if there's rocks underneath or there, there's there's a magic formula and i don't know what it is okay and we need to put that on our list of things to things to find out yeah yeah um so i guess that that's my my cue for uh <laughs> what's not going well and so so my patio where i'm growing more orchids you know, there's some very bright spots and then there's a, a spot that this, so my, my apartment faces Southeast, which you'd think would be great, but the sun this time of year comes over so quickly that it sort of skips this corner and then just goes past the apartment. So mm. I'm not getting a, a good light uh, in one of my sections and, you know, 
too bad, so sad, Calais. You're, you're going to have to deal with it. And it, it's causing some interesting things. I'm going to unblur this, and you guys are all going to see my children artwork behind me. <laughs> um, there we go. So now, ta-da. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. Um, but I want to show you two plants who are probably suffering light deficiency. And this is a first bloom purpurata. Uh, I got this from Floralia at some point, and it's uh, Sanguinea. And you can see, so even for a first bloom, these are wonky flowers. So what happened is this, this one was getting good, typical light as it, as, sh as it should get for, you know, up until, I don't know, mid-May or early May or something. And then the sort of light shut off. So it was able to, to, to bloom, but the blooms weren't great. So it does, it didn't continue getting that energy to get bloom. So if I kept this in th these conditions, it just wouldn't bloom anymore. It would probably continue to grow, um, but it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't bloom anymore. So uh, I, I'm hoping to get this in the sunshine here uh, within, a, you know, less than a year so that it grows. And I have another purpurata and this is like my sort of prize purpurata that I got from uh, Sergio Garcia some years ago and it's Carnea. And what's happened is these formerly gigantic bulbs, you can see, you know, they were huge. They're like potatoes. They, like potatoes. They're, you know, they're still okay. Um, and it's still putting out new growth. So actually, I cut this growth off. So this new growth um, is, I'm going to yank this division out and, and probably sell it. And it's got two new growths coming. But, uh, you know, the lack of light means that it's not getting the, you know, light is plant food, right? And so if it's not getting enough food, it's not able to make those bulbs big and fat the way they should be because it's getting plenty of water. Um, but it just kind of shows you what can happen under dark, too dark conditions, you know, that the leaves get darker, you're not going to get like big fat pseudobulbs and the pseudobulbs aren't, um, they're not just water, it, those, it's sugars, really, it's, it's, it's energy reserves for the plant. Um, in fact, if you, if you were to snap those bulbs in half and smell them, they would, they would be probably kind of pungent, um, because it is a this sort of sugar mixture. It's not, it's not, um, just water. So it can't make enough sugar to sort of divert those reserves to those big fat bulbs that it can draw on, you know, if it gets, uh, unideal conditions. So, um, those are kind of two two interesting negative effects from not enough light. So for anyone listening, if your plants, the cattleyas aren't getting enough light, they're, the bulbs aren't going to be big enough, uh, the leaves are going to be dark, and you're probably not going to get flowers. Or if you do get flowers, they're not going to be up to their full potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the first time I've heard that shriveled bulbs could be a symptom of low light. Yeah, and so... So what would happen is, is if they stayed under these conditions, this large one, the, the subsequent bulbs would just get smaller and smaller. So it, it would continue to live. It just wouldn't be as big. Yeah. It probably wouldn't bloom. In the wild, it would just kind of keep, keep, keep on keeping on until it found a patch of light and then it could actually take off yeah. again. Exactly. Yeah. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't expend that energy to, to reproduce, to make flowers. So cool. that's, that's what's going on. One, one good, I guess I can show this now that I don't have the, the background on. Yeah. That's super exciting. I don't know if you can see the bud. Did it put, that, did it put that growth on this spring? It did. Yeah. Oh, nice. So it basically had no roots. Um, it had like a few. So I've gotten the cypress mulch. I know the cypress mulch holds a little extra moisture compared to the orchiata. Mm -hmm. Um, and I figured that would be good to get it kickstarted and luteola and Rex like a little wetter conditions, I think, than, than the purpuratas and my other standard cattleyas that just get bombed with heat and sun and dry off pretty quickly. Cool. Well, I don't think, uh, Blasphilodiana by Rex has ever been done. So we could maybe think about a pollen exchange. Uh, yeah, that, that is a great idea. I, uh, <laughs> I am totally like down a to it. It probably looked more like Rex, but just a smaller plant, maybe. 
I, I think that's probably, what, yeah, yeah, exactly. Crossing it back would shrink the plant and it would still have that sort of Rex look to it. Mm -hmm. And just be Which a little easier cool. to go to the hybrid, you know, hybrid vigor. Yeah. Hybrid vigor is real. <laughs> cool. Well, as always, a pleasure chatting with you, Stephen. It was good to chat with you and uh, glad to see that you got yet another award and um, wish I could smell it. Yeah, that's, I'm telling you, living, next, living near a judging center is, is definitely has its advantages. For sure. Very cool. Cool. All right. Well, we will see you guys next time. And have fun on your trip. Thanks. All right. Bye, everyone.